Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Hey, I'm Andy McDonald. We'll just we'll just wait uh, a few seconds, and we'll see if we've got a few more attendees joining, and then we'll we'll start the session. Hey, so just to make sure you're in the right place, we're here for uh, the Wind Blades Week webinar hey, on disruptive innovation and the future of blades maintenance. So if you're expecting anything else, hey, feel free to leave. But it's it's going to be a fascinating a uh, discussion with, with the two guests that we've we've got. Great. So the numbers are numbers are creeping up, so it's good. A and some some familiar faces, some some uh, a good blade experts in there in the mix as well. So good. So I'm I'm looking forward to some some good questions, a, coming in from the audience as well. So it's good. Always good to see the high caliber of the the audience a, as we start these. A, great. So. Let's get going. Um, I'm Andy McDonald. I'm the Director of Development and Operations at the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. And the Catapult is one of a network of uh, innovation centres across the UK here to support the economic growth, particularly within the offshore uh, renewable energy sector. So we have uh, about 270 staff, predominantly engineers, and we have some uh, significant uh, test assets uh, that we use for reducing the technology risk of products coming to market within the, the rapidly growing offshore wind sector. Uh, so here to help, um, two of the companies that we're, we've been working with uh, over the last few years, they are uh, 11i and Bladebug. I'm, I'm delighted to uh, welcome uh, the two guests that we have today to discuss this topic, uh, Bill Slater from 11i and Chris Sisnick from uh, Bladebug. Um, so if you'd like to introduce yourselves, Bill, Sure thing. Um, I'm Bill Slatter, founder and CEO of 11i. Um, we offer pragmatic and easy to fit physics based monitoring and analysis systems for uh, wind turbines. Um, as, uh, as blades and turbines are getting bigger, it becomes more and more important that we can get an understanding through these systems um, to look after the OM and for system design sort of feedback. Um, because we look at the blade dynamics, we can easily identify uh, potentially damaging movement or periods in the life of a blade. Um, I think that'll do. Um, over to Chris, I guess. Okay, thanks, Bill. Right, Chris? Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Cheshnack. I'm the founder and CEO of Bladebug Limited. We've developed a, uh, a robot that performs contact inspections and repairs on wind turbine blades. Um, with the objective of improving how it's currently done um, with the objective of producing a levelised cost of energy of these assets and making wind better for everybody. So I'll talk about it a bit more in my presentation, but that'll do for now. Great. Th thanks, Chris. And the, the topic we're, we're, we're looking at today, um, the, the future of blade maintenance, is, is hugely important. So some of the other sessions we've heard in this week are looking at uh, blade design and, and understanding the future of blades getting longer, a, uh, to, to work with larger turbines is hugely important and has been one of the biggest drivers for cost reduction a, over, the, over the last uh, a five or so years where, where we've seen offshore wind come down to, to record levels in, in terms of uh, levelized cost of energy. But I guess you've got to run the blades for at, at least 25 years and, and, and uh, uh, the design parameters are getting longer, a, looking at 30 year lifetimes. And the blades are absolutely you know, they, they, they are the thing that converts the wind energy into the, the rotational energy that we can turn into electricity. So they're absolutely fundamental to what we do, both in terms of uh, performance, eh, but also in, in, in terms of the, the structural reliability of them. And as with any large piece of kit, the, the, the maintenance of it is as important as the, the design and, and manufacture of it to get that lifetime out of it. So there's two sides to that. And I'm hoping that Bill and, and Chris between them will, will cover both of those. So we need to monitor a, so that we understand the, the performance of the blades and how it's how they're lasting over that lifetime. And then we need to do uh, more in-depth inspections around that. And then you get the, the circularity between that, between the monitoring, between the inspection as necessary. There might be repairs or interventions that are needed, but all the time monitoring the performance of that. So these are absolutely critical a point in order to, to maintain the cost reductions that we've got from moving to, to larger and larger turbine. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear a bit more about it. Um, I would encourage you to, to listen to presentations and put questions in the, uh, in the Q&A 
uh, uh, section as we go through. We will have a presentation from Bill, uh, and then I'll ask Chris to, to do his presentation, and then we'll, we'll open up the floor to uh, questions from the audience. So um, if I may, hand over to you, Bill. Sure thing, one moment. I'm hoping that's the full screen uh, presentation you can see there. Is that okay? Perfect. One moment, let me rearrange my desktops. So this is a brief overview of uh, our journey in wind energy. Um, I love and I were based in the P district. Uh, we provide instrumentation, hardware, software, and data analysis for bespoke asset monitoring. Uh, for the last few years, our main focus has been on wind turbine blades, but we're also active in the nuclear industry. Um, our story began in 2015 when I was contracted by Blade Dynamics, who some people may remember, um, and later GE, who brought Blade Dynamics to monitor prototype blades during transport to the test facilities. Uh, the idea of that was to detect damage during transport or, or the lifting processes, and that's some, still something we have an interest in. Um, following this project, we continued to work with the client to look at the detection of issues while the blades were on the ground, so we're looking at consistency of, of blades as built, which is, again, still something we, uh, we're, we're actively pursuing. Uh, while we're undertaking these projects, we were shocked to find out that uh, how little uh, insight the maintenance teams had into the blades when they were spinning. There was a lot of instrumentation on prototype turbines and obviously when blades were being tested, like at the facility at uh, the ORE at Blythe. Um, but once they were in, in the field, there wasn't a huge amount of information coming from the blades. It was all sort of secondhand indirect information from, from the SCADA system. Um, so we began to develop our own products and services with the aim of providing something that would is acceptable on the fleet of wind turbine wind turbines. Um, and we're trying to provide sort of affordable lab quality blade movement data. Um, we've now got our systems onto a prototype turbine um, and we've had that there for almost a year. Um, the customer, which is a large OEM, has placed further order for a, a wider rollout, um, and hopefully this will lead to a, a, a wider adoption. Um, as well as movement data, we're also developing our analysis methods to deliver, deliver damage detection. Um, and some of that's fairly straightforward, but there's more subtle, subtle methods that we can, we can explore with that. Um, and that work package is actually being part funded by Bayes and supported by the ORE Catapult. Um, we've been working with the, the, the team up at, at Blythe quite, uh, quite a lot in the last few months. Um, and we're aiming to disrupt the traditional instrumentation market to allow a wider adoption of uh, sensor technologies. So the question we were asked was, what does a good digital asset management system look like? Uh, well, as far as we're concerned, it's made up of four key components. You've got hardware, which is a physical component gathering data, and in our case, a, a three-axis accelerometer. Um, we've got a back end, which is a system to manage, uh, manage that data, uh, store the data and process data. We also got data analysis, which is the analysis of all the data that's produced by these systems. And finally, we need a way for the user to interact with the system. Um, usually this is in the form of a web dashboard, but it, it could be, you know, it could be a flashing light on a, on a, uh, on a panel somewhere. Uh, in the future, mate, in the future, we may also have sort of direct machine to machine interaction. So we hope to be able to uh, interact in a more direct way. So send a signal to the, the turbine to do a thing, but that's a little bit further down the line for us. Um, so hardware, uh, sensor system needs to be easily fitted in the field. Um, during a recent trip to Instrument 12 Blades, uh, our, our team successfully completed the installation in the time it took another instrumentation company to mark the positions of the sensors in two blades. Um, so we're happy that we've, we're trying to sort of overcome that challenge of something that is field deployable. Um, it takes about an hour to fit our accelerometer survey system uh, to a blade in the field and less if it's fitted in the factory. Um, we've tested this on custom sites and also at the, uh, the ORE catapult site up at Blythe. Um, and this is as part of the Bayes EEF project. Um, another factor which drives the adoption of sensor technology on turbines is cost. Many current solutions are only really used for prototype and special cases to use high costs, uh, where the true potential to, for, for sensing systems is it can only be fulfilled if you get much higher numbers of instrumented machines, preferably from cradle to grave. Um, so we've aimed to provide a cost-effective system which will allow a much wider adoption. 
Uh, finally, the systems shouldn't require specialist fit fitters. Uh, this provides a reduction of personnel constraints and cost. And we've had non-specialist fitters uh, fit our systems in the field with pretty simple instructions. The back end of, of, of these systems is a, a, a digital, sorry, one second. The back end of a digital asset management system should not be constrained in size of deployment. So through the use of cloud computing, we can easily scale. Uh, so we can cater for a small turbine, just the one off, or we can easily up that deployment to cater for a fleet wide adoption. Um, Using a virtual machine, we can also provide a secure and robust and portable method uh, to separate out customer data from one another, removing any risk of data bleed or security breaches. Um, as the data, as the data that comes off these uh, off the machines could be considered sensitive, we've also uh, made sure that our systems can be ported to uh, customer servers, whether that's physical or virtual servers, um, and we've we've basically designed the whole architecture to be hosted wherever it needs to be hosted. And I know that's a, a, a concern for certain, especially with OEMs and, and I guess many sort of owner operators on the O&M companies. So I'm hoping everybody can see the animation that should have started. Um, so analysis, uh, using machine learning to augment, augment physics-based analysis will allow users to ground the output of machine learning while still reaping the benefits. Uh, Eleven and I have provided the most benefit to our customers so far through our engineering understanding of the sensor data rather than AI or machine learning. Um, through, the, through the more traditional engineering analysis methods, we're able to provide the customer with insights into the behavior of the blades straight away without reliance on trends or massive data sets. Um, this animation, um, which I hope you can all see, um, illustrates the capability of the 11i system. And while this is merely a visualization for the engineer, it shows that we can provide the, the user or engineer with the information on the behavior of the, the, the asset throughout its lifetime. Um, the animation shows the behavior of the blade during, during rotation. So this is from a spinning turbine. Um, and it shows movement in the edge and flat directions. Um, with the left-hand side being the, the turbine sort of operating in optimal conditions, and the right-hand side of the, the animation showing uh, the behavior of the blades during a storm. And this is data from uh, a large onshore turbine. Um, the animation illustrates that we can identify periods of, periods of potentially damaging, damaging behavior or periods of damage, damage causing weather, uh, rather than just look for the damage as it occurs or after it occurs. The output, output can be used uh, to give a fatigue accumulation estimate. Um, so for machine learning to really shine, the adoption of condition monitoring should be extended past special cases to uh, larger numbers of fleet to spot trends across all of the machines that have the systems fitted. Um, and this will allow machine learning to predict and preempt blade and turbine issues. Sorry, that took a while to get to pass the animation there. Um, so for the user experience, um, for a good digital asset management system to work, people need to actually take note of the output. Um, alerting should be simple and avoid false positives. Um, comparisons and metrics should allow fast contextual understanding of the alerts. And we're aiming to allow the user to make a, a quick decision based on simple metrics and comparisons. Um, and we should also be able to deep dive into the other data sources. So if you see something that you think merits a, a deeper evaluation of the other, other information you've got before perhaps you use a solution such as Bladebug to go and do a physical inspection, the first step, as far as we're concerned, is a, a quick look at what the other data sources you've got available. Um, so it's important. The other, the other point on here is that it's many organizations have got multiple dashboards already. Um, so we've got to make sure that there's a, a, an application programming interface or an API, as it's more commonly referred to, which allows the data from our system or other systems to be 
implemented and brought into the the customers systems so that they don't have to use a uh, multiple dashboards to to view the information they're getting from their multiple systems um and so the api is is effectively a, a software intermediary which allows the two applications to talk to each other uh, so in summary we uh, we engineer live quality sensors into turbines um we process the data from these sensors uh, on our cloud-based system adding value through both traditional engineering analysis methods and machine learning and this provides detailed information for engineering or o m teams to uh, try and prevent any further sort of damage or and provide system feedback into the system design feedback uh, we're trying to do that in a practical way so that uh, people can get the most out of the system with as with without the usual traditional burden of traditional instrumentation packages um, we're trying to provide a deeper insight into what's happening on blades and to hopefully provide a cost saving for the customer uh, that's the, that's my final slide but there's some contact information there if anybody'd like to get in touch to talk a bit further about the uh, about what we're up to Okay, Bill, thank you very much for that. That's, that's excellent. Lot, lots to think about. So if people do have questions, do put, put them in the question box and we'll we'll come to them at the end. But one, one quick one, at the, the end, you, you talked about increased AEP. Um, is, is there also a benefit a, from a health and safety in terms of fewer inspections, if you understand the blades as well? Uh, I mean, that's it. I mean, so I, I didn't mention it there, but we were, uh, we were part of the Stay Ashore program with the, it was a, uh, KTM program uh, with the RE Catapult and GE, which is designed to keep people on onshore rather than visiting offshore turbines. And and yeah, it sh if we can reduce the uh, the periods between inspection, there's obviously safe a safety uh, gain there. Um, yeah. Okay. No, th thanks, Bill. That's, that's really set us up for some some good discussion. Um, I, I guess at the, at the top I was talking about how you know with any valuable asset that you want to keep running for for a long time, monitoring is absolutely key to that. The second part is is if you if you think there's there's any kind of issues or on a regular basis, there's a, there's a need for inspection. Um, and what I'd like to to go on to is uh, the presentation from from Chris at Bladebug. A, to go into a, the developments that they've been doing in that area as well. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Is that the right screen or you got a second screen? Hey, that's the wrong one. Wrong one? Of course. Thank you. A not yet, unless it's just coming through. That that's still your presentation mode screen. Okay. Thanks. It's okay. I'm seeing this starting to get some questions coming through, which is great. Is that still wrong? Yeah, that's still on your, your presentation one. You you could run it the previous screen you had. That's it. Great. That's it. Finally. Okay. Hold on. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had it right before, but there you go. Um, that's me. So everyone, um, apologies about that. My name is Chris Shashite. I'm the, the founder and the CEO of Blade Limited, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I come from a background as a wind turbine blade designer and uh, as a mechanical and composites uh, design engineer. Um, we have developed uh, the Bladebug robot. It's a technology disruptor with the objective of making wind turbines operate better, more efficiently, more profitable, reducing the cost. And it enables 
wind farm owners and operators to reduce their localized cost of energy by improving their productivity um, and profitability by reducing the costs and risks and um, complexities of turbine maintenance. Um, offshore wind, as a lot of us know, is, is forecast to have um, significant growth uh, over the next sort of 30 years and beyond. Um, and compared to onshore wind, offshore is still relatively young, but it's still growing and it's maturing rapidly as a, as a technology. Um, we've seen prices of the cost of energy higher over the last sort of decade, and they'll continue to do so, but in order to do so, they need to have solutions from all value chains, so from the manufacturing, through to operations and maintenance, through to decommissioning. Um, but it's also worth noting that whilst the growth of, of wind and, and offshore wind is growing, the actual physical size of the growth in turbines is, is also growing themselves. And you know, new turbines for the next generation, or you know, the latest generation of turbines are in excess of 100 meters. And this trend of larger turbines is not going to end anytime soon. So the challenges of maintaining these larger structures in the same method is, is not necessarily um, that feasible. Um, in addition to their increased size, they're being placed further and further from shore. So the new ones will be hundreds of kilometers from the coast uh, in deeper water, um, which the advent of uh, floating wind uh, now enables. Um, and this is really good because so much of the world's offshore wind resource is in water, which is not financially viable or not possible to use kind of like conventional fixed bottom um, type turbines. So for example, 80% of Europe's offshore wind potential is in waters deeper than 60 meters, which is beyond the limit of current fixed turbine types. Um, however, these new floating turbine designs, um, you know, they don't come with, with uh, they come with challenges um, that, you know, I don't think they've necessarily been fully um, understood. So, you know, operations and maintenance, for example, these blades need to keep up with how the technology of, of that technology is advancing. Um, and the reason is because the current method of using, you know, the tried, tried and tested rope access method, it's not fit for the future. Um, it's a dangerous task. Um, it's not to say that there's plenty of injuries, but it's a very well managed risk. But to manage risk is it's cost time and money. Um, there's legislation. Um, there's insurers who want to limit the use of people offshore as owners and operators, as, as mentioned in the previous presentation. And there's an there's an overall push to reduce the health and safety risks um, in the offshore environment. Um, secondly, there's, there's a there's a big skill shortage. You know, we're now talking about in the UK having 50 gigawatts by sort of 2030. We haven't got the the people in place to make that happen. And so, where we can you know use automation to ease that burden, that's that's really important. And it's expensive. You know, as the cost of these turbines are growing, um, and they're, and they're distant from shore, the cost of maintaining them is going to increase um, significantly as well. Um, but we've shown that the, the sector is responsive to new technology. So drones, for example, they've, they've been really good at showing improvements over the traditional visual inspection methods. Um, this is in terms of time and cost, but also in better quality data. So they're able to take data and make more informed decisions about the operation and maintenance of those turbines. Um, but yeah, these challenges become even more pronounced with the advent of, of floating wind and the problems um, that really begin to be sort of understood and realized. So floating wind, for example, there are um, challenges, oops, sorry, there are challenges with um, the motion of, of the, the turbine. So, you know, there's a lot of motion sickness from the technicians who are operating um, tools, for example, there. Getting the crew to transfer from the, from the boat to the turbine, it's even more risky because the motion in the boat uh, differ. And um, as a result of that, there's a reduced operational weather window when inspection and, and these activities can take place. So the sea states, the sea states have to be at a lower level than the current limits for fixed bottom turbine types. So what we've done, we've created Bladebug. It's the solution to safely and quickly carry out repairs and specialist contact inspections on the turbine blades. Now, Bladebug is a six-legged um, walking robot. It adheres directly to the surface of wind turbine blades and is able to safely and quickly carry out detailed contact inspections and repairs. Now, one of the benefits of the robot, it enables a more proactive approach to inspections, maintenance and repairs, and this saves um, operators, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars or pounds per annum um, for each of their wind farms due to, you know, reduced performance and the cost of, of having to shut down these turbines for repairs or when they, they have to wait for they're inspected. Um, so 
Playbug essentially is two elements. <clears throat> it's a platform. Um, one half is a robotic platform, and the second part is uh, a modular tool bay, um, which enables different things <clears throat> to be installed on the robot. Now, I mentioned the robot utilizes um, six legs, uh, which are independently controlled. Uh, they're highly articulated, and that enables the robot to access many parts of the bay. Um, the modular tool bay, that is a really um, interesting um, thing that we've developed. It enables the functionality of the robot to be quickly changed between an inspection device uh, to a repair device by just swapping the tools. And it also enables, you know, industry standard, you know, current tools that are used by robot access stations to be mounted within the robot and used um, as if it was uh, operated by a person, but safely and remotely by the robot. Um, this modular this modular approach helps future proof the system. Uh, it's constantly able to have new tools adapted to it um, as and when they enter the market. Um, and again, this is just a little bit of a, a sort of visual indication of, of how that robot um, can conform and adapt to different parts of the turbine. So we designed the robot for the offshore wind sector first, and this has resulted in it being its small, compact, lightweight, and this is ideal for aerial deployment and retrieval, which we've demonstrated in a, in a previous um, Innovate UK project called Memory. Um, it automatically adapts and conforms to the change in complex geometries of, of a blade, but also you know, the fact it is so adaptable and, and, and agile to other parts of the turbine, such as the tower and the cell. So the robot is a, it's a patented modular platform and it's designed um, with precision control, but with a low technical skill level to operate. So um, the robot can go to areas such as the leading edge. We can go on the pressure suction side of the blades. Um, we can go inside the blade, but then I mentioned other parts. We've just finished a project with GE Renewables and Echovolt where we were using the robot to automate the process of measuring the tension of bolts within the towers. Um, and there's many other parts we can do that too as well. And the benefits of this robot um, is that we can perform more tasks with an existing um, crew. You don't need to have specialist rope access crews anymore. You can upskill general technicians uh, with basic general um, GWO working at heights and who are suddenly able to perform blade related activities from the safety of uh, you know, either um, the SAV or ideally back on a control station um, back on shore. Um, just a little bit of a, a background to how we've got to where we are today. So we've been working on this full time since uh, late 2017. Um, during which we've been collaborating um, the whole time with the offshore renewable energy catapult and that's enabled us to test and validate every element of our robot development from a single vacuum cup through to the first sort of prototype walking robot to then validating that on the blades in the affectionately known um, blade, graveyard, blade, blade graveyard in Blythe up to their test tower and then culminating on the seven megawatt um, offshore turbine in Scotland. So, Back in November 2020, we completed the world's first offshore wind turbine blade walk. Um, we have subsequently been there numerous times and performed uh, various trials, including testing the lightning protection system of the blade. It's worth noting that um, the person alongside this turbine is, is for risk mitigation, but it does nicely show how the robot could work in conjunction with people as a, as a sort of collaborative robot where you know, activities can be performed um, together, where the overall time for a task is reduced and a lot of mundane repetitive work for the rope access technician is removed. Um, and this leads to what the future vision of, of what I think and what, you know, the um, Offshore Innovation Hub thinks that the, the O&M um, of offshore wind will look like in the future. And this is involving you know, autonomous and semi-autonomous systems working together, continually monitoring and maintaining the turbines. So we have autonomous vessels, autonomous drones, um, network and satellite connections, uh, as well as our blade bug robot performing the, the contacts, um, inspections and repairs to the blades. And this isn't a view that I think is now, you know, 2050, this will be within this decade. Um, we've already seen companies such as Ocean Infinity have already started launching their robotic Armada fleet. They've built a state-of-the-art control centre in Southampton. So part of the infrastructure which is currently missing is starting to be built and is now in place. And you know, this is to say that this is not to say that people are not going to be used at all in the future. They will be, but it will just be their time will be optimised and their risk minimised by focusing on the big complex 
um, task, which you know it, it doesn't justify having a, a robot to do. Um, and you know, people's hands are particularly good at adapting to sort of one-off solutions. So that's that's how we see it working. In terms of industry adoption, what's needed? Um, well, first and foremost, we need early adopters. We need to prove and validate the technology, its capabilities. And we've been very fortunate with the early catapult to, to get to where we've got to now. Um, but the best way to accelerate this is with more early adopters. Um, on Monday, we heard from Andrew Bellamy that from LM Blades that this sector is risk averse. However, everyone we spoke to wants this. So someone's going to have to sort of take um, bite the bullet and you know and get these out there and it's a case of when we do do that it's a case of not when um it's not a case of if automated solutions will become your strand it's, it's just a matter of time that it will be a standard um legislation is is another area that needs to catch up so in terms of certifying robot activities, in terms of having heavy lift drones, for example, legislation isn't there yet to enable this to happen. So uh, whilst the tech is, is ready to go, the legislation and, and, and sort of certification needs to catch up and we want to be part of that um, going forward. Um, the infrastructure, I mentioned that Ocean Infinity are having systems in place to do this, but to be able to remotely monitor and control um, these kind of vast systems, you know, the data networks, the security of that data, you know, we need that in place for these um, remote operations to, to happen. Um, I put insurance down because I don't think insurance can be ignored. I think as soon as there is a proven, safer, cheaper way of doing it, there will not only be a, a, a pull from the market, but there'll be a push from company, from insurance as well to have, you know, a safer option with reduced risks. Um, that would be by far their preference. Um, over having to use and maintain turbines with, with rope access technicians. So um, that was kind of uh, a whistle stop tour of, of Blade Bug. So uh, I've got some contact details of myself and, and Stacey, who was meant to be presenting, but unfortunately was unable to do that today. But if you, um, yeah, if you have any questions or what other questions are, I'll be um, very happy to try and answer them. Um, Chris, that was excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and uh, I love the, the vision slide looking forward as well. So I, I, think, I think there's some real opportunities uh, going forward. So it's great. We're starting to get some questions uh, coming through. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd like to go on to this. If I can ask people to put the questions into the, the question and answer box, there's a few coming through on the chat. Uh, if you can put them in the question box, that makes it makes it easier for us to, to see them and, and manage them as well. So I uh, appreciate that, but good to see a few few things coming through. Um, so if I can um, go through those, uh, the first question we've got uh, would be for yourself, Bill, on how mature is the monitoring of current wind farms in the UK? How much would it how much would it cost to have these deployed across a one gigawatt wind farm? So. <sighs> Blades in particular, uh, are, they're not currently heavily monitored. You know, there's not many sensor solutions out there. There, there are there are some. There's quite a lot of interest in uh, the uh, acoustic and um, fiber optic solutions, uh, but it, the cost of these generally sort of means that they are for special cases only. Um, so that's where we come along, and we're trying to provide a solution that is, you know, we're aiming for a, a, a sub five thousand dollar per machine solution um which should be sort of should fit into most people's capex budgets um and if it's fast enough to fit and without having to require sort of a specialist specialist team to fit it we should we believe that that's something that should should be able to push that adopt a wider adoption uh, over over full wind farms rather than just one-offs okay okay no well, thanks thanks bill um the uh, as another question for yourself, uh, but uh, but I think probably oh, if we open this sort of up to, to Chris as well around, he, does the eleven I system have the capability to differentiate between types of blade damage and the category of damage? And can I ask a one of you before <laughs> before you answer that, if you could explain the different kinds of damage a, that you're looking for? Maybe Chris, if you're able to to answer that, the kind of damage both internal and external. Um, would be would be useful background. Yeah, so, so so the robot is essentially agnostic to what it's looking for. But so what we know, some of the main um, areas of focus for us has been leaving edge erosion, which is a phenomenon which is 
it's going to affect all wind turbine blades at some point. So being able to um, you know, treat lean edge erosion for us has been an area of focus in terms of the repair. But in terms of inspection for damage, um, I mentioned the lightning um, protection system check. So this is a very uh, simple check. You're essentially making um, a circuit with the lightning conductive um, system within the blade and measuring its uh, conductivity. But it's really important to know whether or not that system is working. So we're able to check if that system has been damaged over time. Um, and again, things like impact and, and strikes to the blade, um, we can check the defects like that. But the main ones that we're looking at for the moment are lean edge erosion and the uh, lack of protection system, uh, whether or not it's working adequately. Um, I guess the 11i system, we're, we're mostly focused on anything that, that causes a structural change to the blade at the moment. Um, you know. We, we should be able to detect impacts. You know, everybody talks about a bird strike. Um, I know that's sort of a, an anti-wind favourite, um, but I'm not sure how often that actually happens in reality. But we should be able to pick that up if it does. Um, but mainly we're looking for sort of structural degradation, so debonding of, uh, of, of the structure or potentially sort of root faults. Um, we're not we're not likely to see things that are um, more cosmetic and on the external external of the blade. That's actually a really good point. And I, I take back yeah. my statement about that's the only things that we're looking at. So those structural defects, yeah. which are not visible from the surface, that's one of the yeah. key areas that we're looking for. So disponds or in particular, in particular things like that could be um, anything from a manufacturing defect to a serial design defect of the blade that sort of propagate from the, um, the inner surface of the blade outwards being able to determine whether or not blades have those defects before they appear on the surface, which is when it potentially become a, you know, a catastrophic failure. So yeah, we're able to, you know, go to areas and, and using ultrasonic NDT, um, look for damage, which is not visible as well. So yeah, this one from a spar to um, a misplaced ply in the laminate. Yeah, and I think we can sort of, we can riff off each other here. So if, if Blade Bugger did, done such a, 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 a diagnosis of a problem, if we've got a wide enough rollout of, of sensor systems, it would mean that we could feed that back into a machine learning model and potentially sort of give a, a, a more accurate prediction of the, the fault types that are occurring. So initially, you know, when we've got one, one machine, it's something that we can work out using a sort of a physics or an engineering approach to, to that data analysis. But if we were to have hundreds of machines or thousands of machines, which are all of the same design, and we've got known faults, we should be able to start picking those up earlier through machine learning. That's great. And can, can I ask you, just kind of following on from that, both of you, that the rate of change in terms of sensor technology and, and monitoring technology is obviously increasing in terms of, you know, Internet of Things as, as well as uh, uh, edge processing, those kinds of things. Are those changes enabling you to do things that you wouldn't have been able to do three, four, five years ago? Um, yeah, yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, yeah. Go, go, go for Chris. Yeah, so I think I think in terms of what we're doing, which is generating, or you know, we've developed a robot that can automatically walk over the change in services of the blade. If you go back ten years, I don't think a small startup company would have had the ability to do that. I think the technology has advanced to such a stage where you know it's the, the cost of sensors, then the availability of equipment has has come down to such a level where you know a startup can do what we've done and it, it wouldn't be just the case of these multi-billion um, companies with the resources to do that so yeah so it, it yeah if we go back in time we would not be able to do what we've achieved yeah no it's great yeah. no it's, it's it's pretty phenomenal what you guys are doing in terms of the speed of speed of development so uh, keep going um there's a few more questions to 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 come through um so i will try and try and go through there's some, some quite specific ones so for bill does your monitoring system require your own hardware or can you add the backend analysis from existing data in the cloud via an API? So that's one of our, the things that we were aiming to do is to, well, and we, we do do it with, with other systems. You know, we, we've, we've tried to build an ag, a fairly hardware agnostic system. So if, if you can output data, we can bring it into our system. So yes, is the answer. Okay. So, and for for Chris, is Bladebug specifically aimed at wind turbine blades only, or is it flexible enough to be used for other aerofoil type applications? I don't know if there's a there's a specific case case that someone's looking for there, but uh, 
Are you, are you looking at other other applications? Uh, I think we've developed a very capable robot that has many uses in many other areas. So any other industries which use aerofoils, I think the robot is more than capable of being um, utilized without any changes. It's as I mentioned, the robot already we've used it on um, uh, tower inspections, but also areas in the cell. So it's a very um, easy thing to, for us to transition to other industries. But what we are doing is focusing on wind first. We've got such a good opportunity um, and it's such a growth sector that, yeah, our focus is primarily on wind. Great. Okay. There's, there's lots of questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to push through. There's a, there's a comment about, you mentioned the blade graveyard. It's cat. Playground would be a bit better. Yeah. I, uh... <laughs> Suggesting playgrounds, but but on, on a on a serious <laughs> point, we we you know from a catalog perspective, we do have access to old blades on the ground, and and that's a, a real opportunity for a company. So if there's other companies looking to test, do do let us know because it's uh, it's a, it's a, it's an easier way of testing on the ground than it is a uh, at the top of a turbine. So a it's a good point. We will 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 speak to the comms people a, about that one. I, I I guess on the other. Um, point on that and I'll ask Vicky if she can clarify it. I think one of the other a, uh, sessions that we've got is on the circular economy piece, I think, um, a, later in the week. So if we've got details of that, if they can be posted in the in the chat, that would be that would be great. Um, a, so we'll see, see how quickly we can respond to that one. Um, a, on the other questions, let's see where else we've got in. A, so there's a question for Chris. Um, you mentioned that Bladebug would be able to facilitate aerodynamic upgrades. What do you envisage this to entail and how could Bladebug perform these upgrades? So these are these are basically bits of blade furniture that we can assist uh, with applications of the blade. So Vorsex generators is a, is a very um, thing that comes off the straight to my mind. So yeah, being able to apply vortex generators, being able to accurately position them on a featureless big blade is, is going to be key to make sure that you put these uh, vortex generators in the right place and actually adhere them um, in a reliable process and method. So um, yeah, I think vortex generators are one of the main areas that I would imagine there to sort of add aerodynamic performance to turbine blades. Great, thanks. And Chris, just kind of practical questions. Is your solution, does it need the presence of a technical person and how long does it take for a blade a, uh, or tower inspection to take? Um, the answer to the person question, it's it's dependent on us uh, when you look at it in a snapshot. It's like moments in time. So at the moment, yes, we have a person on site um driving the robot but there is no reason that that person has to be on site to operate it um we imagine as I, as I sort of had that vision um of um the robots being controlled completely remotely um so they don't they won't need to be in the future and they will be you know very deployed to and from the turbine so you always have operators keeping like a person in the loop making sure everything's working um correctly what was the second part of the question sorry a so the second part was how long did it take? That was that was. So again, that's the, the idea is that the robot is never intended to perform global inspections of blades. Um, we're not going to compete with drones. Drones are fantastic at doing that, and they're getting better um, at doing that. So we're very much the follow-on element from a drone inspection. So to go to the areas that have been identified from a drone inspection, as I mentioned, areas that have been highlighted from a serial defect, um, we can go to those areas. So we are not talking about a global inspection of blades. We're talking about very um, bespoke areas that we'll be going to. So time-wise, it's very quick. It's it's kind of, yeah, it, depend, it, it, it depends very massively on what we're trying to do as well. But yeah, I can't say the time of a blade because that's not what we're intending to do. Yeah, okay, well, thank you, Chris. A one for Bill, a similar to the question for Chris, and we should have followed up on this one is uh, <laughs> a, can your technology be applied to other non wind a turbine aerofoil applications? I, I believe so, yes. I mean, there's uh, depending on size, uh, as long as it's not a, a tiny thing, then the answer is yes, we, we can use it. And that, it can be deployed on pretty much anything. I didn't talk about it because it is Blaze Week, but we, you know, we, we, do you use these on towers as well? 
Um, so we can do sort of a, a fatigue accumulation on wind turbine towers. Um, I know I've sort of gone slightly away from the question topic, but sort no, of it's good. If, it in there. <laughs> and if, the, if the person asking the question has got a specific application in place, then do get in touch with Bill. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I'd be happy to have really a, a follow up um, question. Hey, a question on repairs, and I'm, I'm really interested. In, you know, we're looking at monitoring and inspection, and repairs was the bit at the top we we, we kind of talked about as the next stage. What's the where do you see the capability going, Chris, in terms of what type of repair you could foresee Blade Bug doing? So, one of the things with Blade Bug, we developed it for offshore which means that it, we've developed it to be small and compact. So we're not talking major big repairs with our system, but what the robot does afford us to do, or afford the industry to do, is take a much more proactive approach. So the early, earlier stage damages for the blades are the category one, the category twos that are generally left until they become more severe, category threes and warrant the, the cost and the risk of sending the rope access crew. That's what we see blade bug really taking a big advantage, you know, really preventing those um, early stage defects propagate into something more serious. So leading edge erosion, for example, treating that when it's really minor, really early, keep on top of it. So it's not a case of, you know, you prevent any aerodynamic losses, you maintain that aerodynamic profile, you're preventing the chance of, um, you know, water ingress to cause you know, potential um, catastrophic failure to the blade. So it's about being able to treat things early and being able to do things in a very um, proactive manner. So because the robot is fast and quick to use, you can deploy it uh, opportunistically. So you don't have to have these big scale campaigns. You can have a crew who are all trained to use the robot or a system where the robot is able to go out. And you know if the weather is um, uh, ideal for inspections, i.e. you're not generating or you're not going to be losing power for a shutdown, the robot can be deployed very quickly and easily to just keep on top of um, all of these activities. So that's how we see the robot really making benefit by just being an opportunistic and proactive approach to, to repairs on the blades. And there's a follow-up question there about um, could you be able to apply coatings as, as part of a repair? Is that, is, that, is that part of the toolkit that you'd have in your... It is, yeah. So the toolkit is essentially, you know, the, the similar process as what is currently performed. So um, sanding, you know, so removing material, um, filling material, and, you know, um, smoothing it out. So one of the nice things about the robot is it removes a lot of the variation from technical operators. So you can end up with a much higher consistent level of repairs. So you can have much higher levels of confidence that those repairs are going to last. And you can have much more confidence that that process, which will be certified, is followed each time because it's the robot performing it at a very high level of repeatability. So um, yeah, we will eventually, in a long-winded answer, yes, we will be able to apply coatings to blades. Great. Thank you, Chris. There's, uh, there's a nice question um, that we've got about would uh, Bladebug and uh, Eleven Eye complement each other and how could you how could you work together? Uh, I, I don't know if, if one of you or both of you want to, to answer what the synergies could potentially be. For me, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, the, the first step, the first action, if we were to highlight a potential issue would be to trigger an inspection, which could be through something, a platform like Bladebug. One of the very important things is that um, there is feedback from from some an inspection like Blade Bug in, back into the 11i system so that we can learn from it. Um, but I'm sure Chris has a, a, another another spin on that. That's my uh, sort of. I can go one step back. So yeah. I, I think that yeah. we could even help with installation. So you talk about having to have specialist yeah. crew. Um, you know, you show people inside blades. Uh, the robot can do that. So again, yeah, simplifying the process of installing these um, sensors for me is, you know, one of the uh, a very clear way that we could work and, and have synergy together. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Good. Hey, so so I'm I'm really excited about both of these applications. What's what's stopping you from going forwards? What are the what are the you know, commercial, structural, regulatory challenges that are, that are stopping this happening? Because it because it all sounds great. Um, I think yeah. Chris, Chris touched on it, and I'm sure we can both talk about it, but trying to find early adopters is, is a tough one. Um, you know, the, the, the industry is pretty cautious, um, and they, nobody really wants to be the first. Um, we're lucky that we have, we have had a, an early adopter now, 
but it's um yeah it was it was hard fought so I, I don't know what your take on it is Chris but I'm sure you'll agree that it, that is a, a difficult thing to get past it's really difficult and again you know hardware technology it's 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 really difficult in the sense that you know there's there's quite long lead times in terms of validating it but also to have a product delivered from day one which is perfect without faults is, is not realistic so having understanding early adopters who want to be part of that journey of actually developing that system with you is is one of the key challenges because everyone that we're going to wants it but it's very difficult to get them to help develop it if that makes sense so um it's about having you know where we are today which is sort of a, a tethered robot mainly operated to selling the vision of that remote operating system that's easy but there's steps in getting there and that we need sort of help along the way um from those um end users to, to do that uh, yeah and sim similarly for us you know the idea that you want bigger data sets so you need more adoption and the more data the more you can get from the system so you know we're lucky that we're, we we can give a user information from day one if they just have one machine you know we could fit it and then a day later we could be telling them how how the system's behaving but the, the real gold is is in the larger data sets when we've got some learning we know what what bad things look like um you know that's that's kind of one of the things that you get through experience uh, and we yeah that's that's something that people need to uh you need you need more customers and you need more machine more machines instrumented basically yeah. But yeah, in terms of like regulation, you know, there's there's no precedent in place for certifying robot blade repairs, for example. So if you're a technician, you could do a you know you do a blade repair training course, and then you're essentially qualified to repair blades. That doesn't exist for for robots to do that. So we have to, in a sense, you know, try and match and exceed what they can do and show that. But regulation needs to catch up. You know, there needs to be. Um, you know, certification in place for, for robotic systems. There need to be um, legislation in place for operating these remotely, be online on site. So that needs to catch up with the technology. So that's why, you know, we have a person on site for the moment. Um, it gets around some of those things. But yeah, in order for it really to have that vision, um, regulatory and, and legislative, legislative issues need to be resolved first. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Chris. I'm looking through the list of attendees to see if I can spot some early adopters. Uh, there's certainly some funders there, so it's good. Uh, but if there's any that's another thing as well. Technology is, is expensive, so yeah, investment is one of the areas as well to find investors willing to invest in, in hardware. This is another challenge as well. No, that's that's good. And and what I would say, you know, my my experience is that going on the journey with companies like Eleven Eye and and Blade Bug is is a hugely rewarding, both both technically and and. Uh, uh, a, you know, getting that first mover advantage from the developers and then from the turbine OEMs, seeing things firsthand and being able to, to influence and add into that has, has a lot of value. Um, and I would strongly encourage a developers and, uh, and, and turbine OEMs to, to get involved with these kinds of technologies because the, there, is, there is real value in being able to influence it and, and gain results early is, uh, is something that I think is... Uh, uh, worth putting the time into um, in order to move it forward. So I'd strong, strongly encourage that. Um, we're we're kind of coming towards the end of, of the time. I, I wanted to give both Chris and Bill um, uh, an opportunity to, to, to kind of explain what their next steps are uh, and, and what you see uh, uh, going forward. And if there's any kind of uh, final messages that you'd like to uh, summarize what you've been saying. Um, if we go to Bill first and then Chris. Okay, so um, I'm guessing the, the, the big thing for us is that we need to continue to explore the different sensor types, whether there are um, other technologies that we need to integrate into our systems. Um, we want to expand our data set, so we want to get more customers um, and look at the look at how we can use uh, uh, these bigger data sets to sort of help with the, uh, the, the process of preventative maintenance. So it's, yeah, carrying on on the same track we're on, really. There's nothing particularly... Uh, radical in our our roadmap it's um just try and get more systems out there okay thanks bill chris yeah so what we're doing we've got um we've got a really busy um 
year ahead of us. So we, we've we've just come out of uh, our final Innovate UK projects, and the um, challenge for us now is is early adopters. So we we've set up an early adopter program where we are showcasing the robot as a as a one on one um, showcase to individual early adopters. We're doing this in in um, uh, the port of Blythe with a little um, test turbine to show an end to end process. And um, for us, it's about having that just like major focus. So we're really focusing on the ultrasonic entity inspection capabilities of the system, really proving and validating and integrating that system um, to have a very useful um, output for the, for the industry. So that's, that's our challenge going forward. Great. Thank you, Chris. I think I'm just checking if there's any final questions. There's no final questions to come in there. Um, so I'd, I'd kind of really like to, to summarize and, and just, you know, go back to the top and, and highlight blades are you know fundamentally the most important part of the, the turbine um, and they need to last a long time to do that we need to ensure that we're we're monitoring so that we can understand a, how they're performing a, over the long term but also how, how they're performing in terms of spotting a requirements for maintenance activity and then we need to find smarter ways of uh, carrying out inspection and and repair um, and as the fleet gets larger and larger, uh, and, and blades get longer and longer, the need for that is is increasing, a uh, uh, very very rapidly, and and it's it's an area that's grown globally as as well. Um, I think we've got from both Chris and Bill, you know, kind of visions of the future. There's 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 you know really really powerful technologies that are bringing together, cutting edge uh, technologies, to putting those together in ways that that you know we wouldn't have been able to do. A five years ago, and I think there's there's real potential for the growth of, of both technologies. So, hopefully, that's given you an insight into into the future. Um, a if you if you want to follow up, um, I'm sure that we've got details of Bill and Chris, and and we can uh, you can find out where they are. If you want to find out more about the catapult, then please do please do get in touch. Um, this is the third in in uh, a series of Blade Week webinars. So there's two more to go. A, and I think the link for the uh, other ones has been posted in the chat if you aren't able to find that. So please do join us for the next uh, next two days as well. So firstly, thank you. Um, thank you to Chris and to Bill for their presentations. Um, and thank you to the audience for, for joining and uh, a, a great selection of questions as well. So uh, I've enjoyed it. Thank you to the guys and uh, we'll speak to you soon. Okay. Pleasure. Thanks for inviting us. Okay. Thank you very much. Cheers.